being. I, I know, uh, Kevin, that uh, you have to leave a, in a very short while, but uh, I, I do look into the room. If, if there are questions, I'm happy to take one or two, uh, as long as the questions are brief, and uh, so we can get Kevin out uh, just in time. Please introduce yourself. Thank you very much, uh, Nicolas Veron at Bruegel and the Peterson Institute. My question is a little bit uh, nerdy, but I think it's of general interest. You mentioned uh, Deng Xiaoping as having created institutions and processes. As you're well aware, Prime Minister, as a, there is a bit of a revisionist debate about this, a book by Joseph Torrigen in particular this year, but many other scholars. So um, can you expand a bit on it? How do you view that issue in retrospect? Haven't we overestimated the degree to which the Communist Party had committed itself even before Xi Jinping to orderly succession policies? And uh, what is the balance between Xi Jinping as an individual and the more collective body of the party on this issue going forward? Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Well, thank you. Well, thank you for the nerdy question. Um, it's a gathering of nerds, so um, uh, we're happy to uh, deal with questions of complexity, uh, including those of recent uh, Chinese Communist Party history. I think uh, the starting point in terms of politics is how did Deng Xiaoping and the Chinese Communist Party conclude the party's formal conclusions from the period of the Cultural Revolution? And the way in which they did that, as you will be aware, is in the 1981 um, special resolution of the party on uh, recent questions in party history. And that was the formal summation uh, by the party center of what went wrong with the Cultural Revolution, with the Great Leap Forward and the anti-rightist movement all the way back to 1956. And the evaluation was as follows. Number one, uh, we, the Chinese Communist Party, must reassert the principles of collective leadership. Number two, we cannot allow the, uh, a principle to emerge of leadership for life. And three, we can no longer afford any form of cult of personality. Those are direct quotes from the 81 document. Um, and that established the orthodoxy during the Deng Xiaoping period, the Huiabang period, the Jiaoziang period, the Jiang Zemin period, and the um, Hu Jintao period. And it was only by the time we got to 2017, uh, more than 35 years later, that we saw the beginnings of the change of these principles. Uh, we saw, for example, in the National People's Congress in March of 18, a decision to abolish the two-term limit, which had been previously observed uh, by and large uh, by um, uh, Xi Jinping's predecessors. Uh, we certainly um, uh, also have seen uh, the emergence of new forms of the cult of personality around Xi Jinping. Um, and there is no prospect that Xi Jinping is likely to move from the stage anytime soon, opening up the question that leadership for life is once again back on the table. And so I think these represent significant departures from this earlier formal resolution of the party's history. And the last nerdy part of the answer to the nerdy question which has just been uh, asked is that uh, on the centenary of the party's founding, which was on 1 July 2021, they produced another major uh, resolution uh, reflecting on the party's history. And what's fascinating about that is that when Xi Jinping, presiding over that meeting, reflected back on the 81 parties resolution on previous party history, that document produced in 2021 excluded all the references to collective leadership, to avoiding leaders for life and avoiding cults of personalities. So therefore, there is a documentary change uh, in the practices reflected in these high documents of political resolve. Thank Back. you very much, Ali. Back to you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, let's take one final question uh, from the audience. Uh, microphone is already in your hands. Perfect. Well, uh, Narendra Taneja from India. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, you mentioned about China could possibly be launching a new charm offensive. Could you elaborate? Are you referring to a customized 
BRI 2.0 targeting Europe? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, the um, a customized BRI uh, targeted on Europe, I'm not sure. Uh, BRI 1.0 has proven to be very expensive for Beijing. Um, it was a, launched as a two to three trillion dollar initiative. Um, and after $750 billion worth of expenditure, the central financial authorities in Beijing have begun to trim it back to something with a cap or a ceiling of about one trillion. So I don't think that is likely to be the case in terms of rolling out that type of charm offensive towards the Europeans. I expect that what's more likely to be rolled out towards the Europeans is a whole series of new attractive market openings for European exports and furthermore investment opportunities for European firms. Um, and the reason I emphasize this is because the interest which the Chinese have is as follows. Looking forward to uh, the day when they may need to mobilize uh, global support or at least encourage global neutrality against a possible Chinese military action against Taiwan. What China does not want to happen is to have the Europeans join in financial and economic sanctions against China at the America's request, as occurred most recently uh, over uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So what is animating China here is to peel the Europeans away from the United States over time. And furthermore, if they can do so in the meantime on the question of technology exports, and you would have seen, for example, the statement by the US uh, Department of Commerce on the 7th of October from memory, banning uh, US uh, semiconductor uh, exports to China and calling upon its allies to do the same, and I see the Dutch have just joined suit. Um, the effort which China will be making to provide other incentives for the Europeans in terms of market access for goods and services and investment access for European firms, I think is the way in which they're going to seek to ameliorate um, China's image in Europe after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, as well as to discourage the Europeans from joining the United States at some later point around Taiwan contingencies. Kevin, I said we, we are wrapping up the Q&A part, but when the host of the conference uh, is, is reaching for the microphone, of course, we will uh, allow him to do so. Thierry, please, you're up. Well, uh, Kevin, I don't know if you see me, but I can assure I you. I can, Thierry. OK, because I can assure you that this is me. Mm -hmm. And uh, it looks, uh, uh, for sure. So I want to tell you, <laughs> I want to thank you very, uh, very much. Uh, you were excellent, really. And uh, the moderator was very good, too. So that's a good couple, I must say. And um, I thank you, especially because I know that it was not easy for you to, to do it. So my conclusion is that uh, I want to book you uh, with the World Policy Conference for the next 30 years to start with, yeah. to, to start with, and uh, as many meetings in Paris at IFRI. Yeah. It's that clear? Agreed? Pas de problème pour vous. Merci. I, th I think Kevin. I think the invitation for 2023 has already uh, been issued. That's for sure. Uh, that, that's for certain. And then obviously we will be more than happy to welcome you in person this time. Uh, final question before we wrap up the session. You are one of the most pro uh, preeminent China experts out there. You've proven it again today. You've proven it last time you and I met in Singapore at the Asia Pacific Conference of German Business not too long ago. What is the biggest Western slash global misconception that we have of China? What are we paying too much attention to and not enough? I think the, um, the problem, and let me just speak about the United States because I'm more familiar with that 
than I am necessarily with the Europeans, but I do spend a fair bit of time in in Brussels, Berlin, and um, and uh, Paris these days. Um, we've just established an Asian Society Centre in Paris as well. I spend less time in London because I ne never know who's going to be in government in London, but that's a separate matter. Um, but as far as the United States is concerned, I think there is a, a temptation in this country or predisposition in the United States to assume that China is somehow 10 foot tall, um, as opposed to uh, the reality as perceived by China domestically, which is a company which, which is a country replete with massive domestic challenges. Uh, the number one domestic challenge actually is the economy. The Achilles heel for Xi Jinping is future economic growth, particularly given his ideological reset for China has created new disincentives for the Chinese private sector to continue to vigorously invest in private fixed capital investment. Then you have the problem of demography. China's got the second lowest birth rate in Asia after South Korea. You have an age dependency ratio, which has now reached almost developing com developed country standards. And furthermore, population peaking next year uh, as uh, India surpasses China as the world's most populous country with 1.4 billion people. And then you throw in other factors like um, the impact of COVID. Therefore, the economic headwinds bearing down on China, both domestic and external, are huge. And so I think the misconception that I often have to deal with here in the United States is to assume that China is this um, uh, unstoppable monolith uh, moving inexorably towards um, a global domination, when in fact it is a much more complex reality than that. And I think, and as I say to the Americans, if you guys are six foot two, think of the Chinese as five foot nine. Um, now they're still growing, um, and sooner or later they're going to be six foot, um, and you guys are still likely to be six foot two. But the assumption that China is already 10 foot tall, um, I just don't think is wise uh, from an analytical point of view. And if policy is based on analysis, uh, then a more moderate view of China's growth trajectory should inform a more cautious approach to policy as well. Back to you, Ali. Echoing what uh, Thierry said, I think I speak for all here in the audience that this was a very content-rich, perfect, rewarding ending to a very long day, day one of the World Policy Conference. The former Prime Minister of Australia, Kevin Rudd, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Thanks, Ali. Thanks, Thierry. All the best to those of you in Abu Dhabi. Bye then.